Today's scripture uh, is from Acts, second chapter, verses 1 through 21. I'm going to be reading from the Revised Standard Version, and here's a disclaimer. I'm going to butcher the pronunciation of some of these ancient cities and or countries. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were, stay there were staying in Jerusalem God-fearing God Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard this sound, a crowd came together in bewilderment, because each one heard them speaking in his own language. Utterly amazed, they asked, Are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Parthians, Medes, El Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia. Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they ask one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they have had too much wine. Then Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and addressed the crowd. Fellow Jews and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These men are not drunk. As you suppose, it's only nine in the morning. No, this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Sorry. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. This is the ending of God's word for today. Let us pray. Father God, may the meditations of our hearts and the words of my mouth be pleasing to you. Holy Spirit, come be with us, move amongst us, stir our hearts and our minds to hear your message. In Jesus' name, amen. So today we celebrate and remember the first Pentecost, the day the Holy Spirit came to earth to be with us and the founding of the church. Now, some of us have done this better than others, right? Remembering to wear our red. Yeah. We retell the amazing story of how they were able to speak to such a large crowd and to everyone that was listening, being able to understand them. And we remember on that day how 3,000 people became believers. We like to tell the story of how so many were brought to Jesus in such a short amount of time. We like to talk about how the people that listened to them supposed that they were drunk on wine. And Peter says, no, it's only nine o'clock in the morning. What are you talking about, guys? But often when we read scripture, we tend to read it as historical account. We look at the who and the when and hopefully the why of the things that we read. 
but we fail sometimes to read scripture as literature. Now do not misunderstand me here. I am not advocating that we are reading scripture as fiction. I believe in the word of God. But I think we can gain more meaning at times if we were trying to read scripture and think and feel what the people would have been feeling. So let us consider the apostles on this day and what they must have been feeling at this point in their life. See, I think they must have been feeling a bit lost just in this moment before the Holy Spirit comes. Jesus had been crucified, resurrected, and ascended. He had promised them that the Holy Spirit would come to them, but it hadn't come quite yet. They must have been looking at each other and at least thinking, what is next? What steps do we need to take? How do we begin to do what Jesus has called us to do? Now, perhaps they were feeling a bit sad and empty. Think about it. They had just spent so much of their young lives following Jesus around, seeing the wonderful miracles that he did, trying their best to learn the lessons that he was teaching them. They had seen the horror of the crucifixion and experienced the unbridled joy of the resurrection and then had spent more time with Jesus and hearing his final words in his human form and watched him ascend to heaven. Now, I don't know about you, but if I had been there and experienced all of those things in my life, it would be awful hard to think that anything better was going to happen in your life, right? See, there's an ebb and flow to our lives and their lives as well. Moments of great joy and great sorrow. Moments where we're experiencing those wonderful things and also those tough things in life. I want you to think about the greatest vacation you've ever been on, or maybe the biggest event you ever went to in your life, a concert or a sporting event, whatever it may be. Do you remember all the excitement in the buildup to that? Do you remember how you were just couldn't wait to go and be there? Can you remember the time that you spent in that place? Now, you were probably ready to come home by the end, right? There's no place like home after all. But do you remember the feeling of settling back into everyday routine? I know for me, after a vacation, it can feel like a bit of a letdown once you start to get back into that everyday routine. And I think that maybe the apostles might have been feeling that before the Holy Spirit came to be with them. But the Holy Spirit does come to be with them. They found that however they had found themselves feeling that day prior to that it is replaced by a feeling of joy at the coming of the Holy Spirit. God breathed onto them the rushing wind and placed upon them the tongues of fire and they were off and running with the ministry of Jesus. Oh, to feel that excitement in our lives again, right? To look forward to what is on its way. Again, I say we live in this ebb and flow of life. And sometimes I think we treat the Holy Spirit that way as well. We feel it strongly at times in our lives. And in other times we wonder where the Holy Spirit is. Now I've heard people say that they do not experience the Holy Spirit in church. They feel as though the Holy Spirit isn't with us. Brothers and sisters, my first question to you is this. What is the church? Is it these walls? Is it this space? No, we know the answer, right? We know that the church is the people. So my next thought is, if we're not feeling the Holy Spirit in our church, and we know that the church is the people, then what do we need to do in order to fill the Spirit with us again? Is it to change pastors? 
Is it to change our music? Is it to drink more coffee before the service so we're wired the entire time? Well, the answer is maybe. Maybe it is one of those things, and maybe it is none of those things. And I know everyone loves that answer from me when I tell you maybe. Pastor, just tell us what we need to do. Don't speak in riddles. Well, I say it might be those things because, well, it might be one of those things that needs to change. Maybe we do need something different. Maybe you need something different so that you can feel the Holy Spirit. I will say this, and I must question all of us if we're feeling a lack of the Holy Spirit in our lives. When was the last time you asked the Holy Spirit to come and be with you? When was the last time you opened your heart and your mind to be filled by the Holy Spirit? When was the last time you asked the Holy Spirit to be with you in a moment that wasn't when you were in a down moment in your life? You see, we could have the greatest pastor in the world, and believe me, I know that is not me. We could have the greatest musicians playing for us each week. We could have a Starbucks or a Dunkin' Donut in the lobby. And if we're not opening our hearts and inviting the Holy Spirit in, then we will never feel the Holy Spirit. You see, God has made a promise to us. And that is he has given us free will. He has given us the ability to choose if we will follow him. Well, the same thing applies to the Holy Spirit as it is part of the Trinity. The Holy Spirit is not going to force itself upon us. We must be willing to allow it into our lives. Now, you may be asking yourself this question this morning. Why? Why should I want the Holy Spirit to come into my life? I don't need to be able to speak in tongues. I don't need to be able to have a little bit of fire on my head. I'm perfectly happy the way I am. I am good with what I have arranged with God. Well, that is true. It might be true. You might be happy with what you have arranged with God and how your relationship is going with him. But the real question you have to ask yourself is this. Is God happy with the relationship that you have arranged with him. You see, in order to have the relationship that God wants you to have with him, you need the Holy Spirit to be a part of your life. Without it, that relationship with God is incomplete. Without the Holy Spirit, we find ourselves in one of those ebb moments in life. We find we are doing what the apostles were wondering, what is next for us? Well, the Holy Spirit can help guide you in the direction that God is calling you to go. Notice I said, guide, not force. As I said before, ultimately, you're going to have to take those steps forward yourself. Why else would you want the Holy Spirit? Well, can you remember when you were a kid and the adults were talking and you could hear the words they were saying, but you just couldn't understand what they meant? Did you ever run into this one as a kid? I think someone is T-I-R-E-D, and they need to go to B-E-D. And you find yourself as a child thinking, I wonder what T-I-R-E-D and B-E-D means. Now, we did that a lot with our own children. It works great until they learn how to spell, right? We feel like that sometimes, though, when we're trying to understand what God wants from us. We can feel... Like that sometimes when we're reading scripture, I get that you're saying something, God. I see that I am reading something, but I just can't quite comprehend what it is that you want from me or how it might apply to me. Well, the Holy Spirit can work in us to help us understand what it is that God is trying to tell us and what it is that we should be learning through scripture. Without the Holy Spirit, we couldn't possibly begin to understand the complexities of God. More on that next week. 
without the Holy Spirit, something is lost to us when we read the Bible. And finally, I think we need the Holy Spirit in our lives to feel a sense of peace. I believe that the Spirit helps us connect to that part of God that allows us to be at peace. To be at peace when things are good and to be at peace when things are bad. I often think of the hymn, It is well with my soul, as being at peace and being able to say that no matter what comes my way, I trust you, Lord, and the Holy Spirit will give me peace. When we are able to allow that Holy Spirit to move in us that way, I think we will experience the flow of life, the flow of wonders that are so great we can't even begin to fathom them. Just like in our scripture for today, when we hear that they were able to speak to so many people in their own languages and be understood, we think, how? How is that even possible? Well, the answer is easy. The Holy Spirit is the how that is possible. So let us commit ourselves to inviting the Holy Spirit into our lives and see how it will help us move. Who knows? We might even bring 3,000 people into the kingdom of God. My challenge for you this week is this, is to pray each day for the Holy Spirit to come into your heart. Amen.